I'm going to be over in um, Luke chapter 3 and Joshua chapter 4 um, for a little while. We'll, we'll, we'll see. There's some, I think it's important that we have Bible knowledge, that, that, we know, that we know things in the Bible, that we know Scripture, and that we know where things happen. Um, I've always had this, um, this desire when I study, and I got a cute... <laughs> I had a preacher get on to me one time that I majored on minor things that I would never, if I continued to do that, I would never learn to preach. I said, okay, um, he's not preaching. I still am. So, And here's the thing. What happens is if we're not careful, we won't learn the minor things. We'll just do, we'll know a lot about David and Goliath, a lot about, you know, um, Joan and the well. We'll know a lot about Jesus walking on water. There's little things in Gilgal that you need to know about. There's places on the Jordan River where um, the children of Israel crossed the Jordan River and then John the Baptist baptized. And I think these things correlate. Um, I hadn't been able to piece it together 100%. So if you want to help study there, um, that'd be great. I, I think that the same place, Brother Mike, that the children of Israel crossed the Red Sea, across the Jordan River in Joshua chapter 4 is the same place... Um, John the Baptist baptized Jesus. And I'm, I'm, we'll talk about it here in just a few minutes. I'm going to talk to you, talk about why that's important and, and what it means and what they did there. And, and I think it's important. There's a lot of key things we could pull out of there. And, and it's just my Bible study. Uh, uh, this may not be preaching tonight, but it's good Bible study. And I think it's things we need to hear um, because it, it, it grows your knowledge. Your, your knowledge. You, you, everybody remember those ESPN commercials in the early 2000s? You know, where the, the guy had this big, had this, he called it his uh, sports knowledge. And it was this little hairy ball about this big around like a basketball. And it was called his knowledge. And this guy said, he likes to talk, his buddy was saying, he likes to talk about his knowledge. I get tired. He said, so one night I brought out my knowledge on sports. And in walked his knowledge. It was a big, giant, hairy looking ball on legs. And it come walking in. He said, that's my knowledge. So, and I talked to some kids about that this morning. Um, over at Southside, I said, you know, we need to increase our knowledge. We need more knowledge about Bible. We need more knowledge about, about church things. I think it's important that we, that we do that. Um, prayer requests. Um, Miss, um, Miss, I don't see Miss Amy. Miss Amy's got a cousin. I forget her name. Um, a last name of Cruz. Cruz. Say it again. Peggy, Peggy, that's exactly right. Now, she, they, they did, they, for some reason... She was at the hospital yesterday or today. They looked at her lungs and she had cancer. They took the cancer out. Today. She didn't know till today. Uh, that's, that's tough. So keep them in your prayers. Uh, can you remember Minner Garvin, a friend of ours in Folkestone, um, who uh, is still, still struggling with uh, getting over um, some things? We hope that in the next few weeks, he's had, he's had they take his stem cells out, do something, and put them back, and they're supposed to help his cancer. I, I, I don't know how that works. But um, pray for him. Um, that, that, that all works out good. Um, good daddy. Good daddy. Uh, any others? Mr. Mr. Eldon, uh, tell me your people's names again. So I, I, I don't want you to say the big three. I want to remember. Eldon, Kathy, and Bill Vaughn.
Amen. Any others? Good to see you, Parker. Yes, sir. What's Mr. Howe's first name? Jack. Jack. Jack and Rita. Is that what you just said, Jack and Rita? Oh, you. Yes, sir. Did you have that done again? You'll be an old pro at it. Well, if you decide to do it on yourself at your house, call me. I'd like to watch that. I've always, you ever see them do them knee replacements? I used to love watching them do those on those medical shows on TV. And guy would get out the little stainless steel. It wasn't nothing but a sawzall. They cut, a, they cut the knee out and shape it and bolt that back. Man, I could do that. Pull that baby apart. And listen, I, I feel like I could do that. But I'm thankful I don't have to. Family. You're going to have to take the lead on them girls getting baptized, okay? You're going to have to take the lead on them girls getting baptized, okay? Try to work it out for next Wednesday if we, if we can. But I need to know if we can't, okay? You got a way I can get I thought we have church. Uh, any others? Yes, ma'am. The little girl that's um, a baby that a uh, lady works for Cheryl, she, uh, her daughter is sick with, with, a, with a flu of some kind. And now the daddy's sick. He's an officer. They're young and they're in, a tr- they're in trouble. But um, because all the adults are more needy than the kid. And I hope they're watching. They're more needy than the kid. <laughs> so they better get some of their people over there to take care of them. But keep them in your prayers. Byron... Um, Byron Green. Byron came here to church. Byron and... Uh, say it again. Marley. Marley. Came to church here. And they came here probably three years ago. Just long enough to get juice back up. And they went back to their church where they're still at. So keep them in your prayers. Any others? Brother Leon. Anybody heard from him? Listen, I've tried to call Brother Leon. Uh, uh, I, I haven't been able to get through to anybody. I, know, I sent a text to Travis this morning to see what hospital he's in. Did, did, did somebody say Baptist? Did I hear Baptist? Is it Baptist? Yeah. Um, I sent Travis a text. If anybody finds out where it's at, I'd like to go see him Friday, but I don't know if they're taking visitors. I got word through Brother Albert that, that I could probably go down there. So, but I want to check before I go. You know, uh, I haven't been able to get, get in touch with him. Any others? Any unspoken? Amen. Let's have a word of prayer for our prayer request. Lord, thank you for tonight, for the people that's here. God, as we study your word, God, I pray as we dig in there, Lord, um, we dig out some golden nuggets, Lord, as we study your word and and figure out, God, um, direction in our own lives and see, God, you doing things three, four thousand years ago, recognizing, God, that you're still doing some of those very same things today. Help us recognize, God, when you're at work and get involved in those things. We lift up these prayer requests, God, to you. There's so many. But I lift up Brother Leon to you, God, that you'll, you'll do a work in his life and send him home from the hospital. Uh, pray for uh, Jack Rita Howe, all those folks around us. Um, and just continue to pray, God, for all our families that need prayer, our grandparents, Lord, those sick with cancer, uh, those that are, are struggling with, with finances, Lord, just so many myriad of problems in this, this day and age. Pray, God, you'll bless each one. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, pray, for, pray for the youth and kids over at Southside uh, School. Brother Ronnie, I was over there today. I was preached this morning at 8.30, and I preached at 9 o'clock for all the kids. Man, them's the best little listeners. I had the best time. You was there. Matter of fact, you get to hear tonight's sermon again. But uh, this will be a little different, I hope. But uh, I, I, I teach these kids you know, you, you, try to, you try to teach them some things, and you'll be shocked. These kids, they don't have to hear about Jonah and the well. Man, you go talking about Joshua and the Bible, and, and, th- and they don't want to hear it. They'll sit on the edge of their seats. The little guys, I mean little guys, sat stock still. Well, I talked to them about Zacchaeus today. You know, that's good stuff. You know, and pray for them. Pray for the youth over there, because uh, Brother Tyler, I asked them how many of them was in a youth group, you know, that... That first off, I asked him how many was in a youth group. And everybody went, mm, well, some did, raised their hand. And so I asked him how many was in a Bible study. 
away from not just at school, but with, with other kids their age? Nobody. Nobody. So we're trying to get some of those kids. If, do you need me? Okay. You had that look like, hey, I need you. I wouldn't doubt it. You got brought Brother John too. Ah, this brother's checking you out. But uh, it, it, these, 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 these kids, I was asking kids, I said, listen, do y'all have a uh, have Bible study? And then hard and raise your hands. So I asked the girls that were there, I said, how many of you be interested in, in meeting with some of our girls for, vaca- for vacation Bible school for a Bible study on Tuesday evenings? Oh, that was great. So Bailey might have a crowd coming up, at least five or six more, you know. So then, you know, I stuck my neck out because the boys was like, I said, how many of you boys would like to have a Bible study? That's probably what Brantley's going to do. He probably don't know it yet. But how many of you boys would like to have a Bible study in the evenings, maybe a day a week or once a month? And I said, y'all, just, y'all, y'all get with me if you decide to. Get with Miss Libby. They didn't leave. 20 boys want to have a Bible study in the evenings. Man, that's awesome. Will I, do it? Will I go over and do it, Brother Ronnie? <laughs> you bet I will. Uh, we'll, find, we'll find time. There's time. It just depends on how you want to spend it, amen? So um, looking forward to that. Y'all pray for these kids. Pray for these kids. Pray for the school. Pray for school over there. People in it. Pray for their church. Pray for Brother Teak. Uh, Brother Teak's had time with his, with, with his, he's had some COVID. He's had surgery. He's had time the past few months. So uh, y'all pray for him and, and pray for the folks over there. That Brother Teak gets squared back around and is able to, able to, able to do what he, I know he wants to do. So keep him in your prayers. But this is what we talked about today, and I hate LJ having to do it again. Why ain't you, 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 you don't want to? Good. Do make me feel good. So take your Bibles with me. I'm going to start out in Luke chapter 3. And we're going to talk about John the Baptist and where he's baptizing um, in the Jordan River. Now, right here at Jordan River, where they're baptizing, is, 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 is just... I think about four or five, maybe six miles off the Jordan River going um, west. If you're, looking at your, if you're looking at your map in your Bible and you see the Jordan River just above the Dead Sea, maybe 12 miles, 13 miles, maybe less, I'm, I'm guesstimating. Because I'm, I'm, I'm trying to envision the little um, mileage thing in my Bible. And, and, you know, but anyway, so it's about 12, 13 miles up from the Dead Sea. And about six miles is Jericho. So Jericho, somebody tell me a Bible fact about Jericho. Anybody? A Bible fact about Jericho. It's good. Walls came down. Uh, matter of fact, Joshua, we're talking about in chapter 4, that's where they go next. They go into the, prom- they go into the promised land, bring the walls down in Jericho. One of the greatest victories. Um, when these walls came down, Joshua, they were, nobody was ever supposed to rebuild. Um, they weren't supposed to be re- rebuild a city. Uh, but we find it later on in the New Testament. We, we find Jericho again. So it was one of the cities that wasn't supposed to be rebuilt. They said Jericho, the original walls of Jericho, was so wide that you could drive two teams of horses pulling chariots on top of the walls of the original Jericho. And those are the walls that came down. And, and it was told it wasn't supposed to be. But Jericho in those days was, if you was going on vacation, if you was a family that had some wealth, you want to go visit somebody, Jericho was the place to go. That was the place in that area, in the Middle East. The, um, the Maccabees, uh, a group of people that lived on the east side of the Jordan River, supposedly, tradition says, where John the Baptist may have been with those people, the Essenes, over with those group of people that was on that side of the Jordan River. And supposedly, that's where he got the, the baptism part. I believe it was the Holy Spirit of God just, just taught him. Or the Holy Spirit put him with a group of people that he could glean things that God wanted and put him where God needed him. I, you know, we, we, can, we can say it, how, figure out man's way all we want to, but sometimes God just lines things up in people's lives. You'll run, listen, little kids are running into your life. People are running into your life. And I don't know if it happens to you this way, but there's times that I run into people and God will say, pay attention right there. Pay attention to that person. There'll be a time. There'll be a time that, you know, I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's discernment, insight. Listen, I believe that, I believe that God in his infinite wisdom, um, uh, we talked about Bible prophecy a few weeks ago. I believe God speaks to us about things. And we're supposed to pay real close attention. If this Holy Spirit inside is living inside of us is a third part of God, 
that God inside of us bears witness to facts he, want, he wants us to know. And, you know, I, I don't want to seem all eerie or like I should be a, a palm reader or anything like that. But I believe there's times where we're told to pay attention close. Now, I believe John the Baptist was taught by a group of people that allowed him to come back and do God's work. I mean, he, listen, he, he served God. His daddy was a priest, Zechariah. Remember how we got him? So here we are in John chapter 3, and John preaches repentance. Now, the greatest need, I, talk, I told our kids this morning, the greatest need that we have is deciding what we do with our sin above anything else, above anything else in our life, above, above all else, what you do with your sin. There, there, there are people today, and, and that's for saved people and lost people, what you do with your sin. As a lost person, if you don't, if you don't give your sin away, if you don't let Jesus take away your sins, you're going, you're going to find yourself in a devil's hell one day. And you won't be there on probation. You'll be there on an extended stay. It's not something that you go down to and where some believe you can get purchased out of. It's not like the, the, the show uh, that's on TV, Supernatural, where the guy supposedly descends down into hell for six months and then was able to come back. Listen, that's a fallacy. That's all wrong. When you take your last breath here, you've made every decision you'll ever make. It ain't up to you anymore. So what you decide to do with your sin as a Christian is important. Because the Bible teaches us that we are still responsible for the things we knew to do and did not do. So it's important that we do something with our sin. Every day, I want to end of the day, Lord, forgive me. I try to remember. I try to go back and over the day. I'm laying there in bed and I, you know, listen to the fan. I try to remember how big of a knucklehead I was. It usually isn't hard to remember. But I want to pray and ask God to forgive me, you know, because I want it to be, when I get up the next day, I don't want to get up with the burden I had laid down with the night before. And I got to let it go. I, I, the older I get, the easier it is to let it go. I'll be honest with you. It's, get, it's gotten easier. I've prayed for more faith. God's given me more faith. There's not a, I think I said this this time past week, there's not a faith barrel where you go get more faith. There's nothing like that. You pray and ask God to give faith, and God gives faith. That's where it comes from. He's the originator. He's the author of faith. So if he's the one that gives it, he's the one I need to talk to. How do I talk to him? I get cleaned up. I get cleaned up. I get this heart right. And then I beg God for, for faith. That's how it works. That's how it works. So here we have John the Baptist. Here um, he's, he's, uh, he's where God wants him. He's a, he's, a, he's a strange bird. He's lived out in the wilderness. He's, he's had all these things. We had these visions of him of, of you know, uh, his, 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 his dress and what he's eating. We, we, we find that from a little kid. And it was fun today to teach the little children about Zacchaeus because I'm acutely aware that I'm beginning to build their knowledge about things. Every time they hear about Zacchaeus now, they're going to remember that he had a secretary named Barbara. Now, I told him that, I was, that wasn't real. I was making that up, but it's fun. And it, it keeps them coming. So as, when they're adults, Mr. Page, they're going to remember when I'm dead and gone that he probably he had a secretary, I bet you. And, and they're going to be in God's word. They're going to think Zacchaeus was a short, fat guy in a shiny suit and shiny shoes. That's what I told them. Now, whether he was or not, I don't know, but it makes, makes perfect sense to me. <laughs> but here's what happened at John chapter 3. Now, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius, Caesar Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip tetrarch of Iturea, and, and of the region of Trachonitis, and Lysanus, the tetrarch of Abilene, Annas and Caiaphas, Annas and Caiaphas, being the high priest, the word of God came into John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And he came. The word of God came to him in the wilderness, and he came. When he was out there by himself in the wilderness, God spoke to him, and he did what God told him to do when he received word from God in the wilderness. You'll find that, that, that the way God does that, it's, he does that in that way a lot of times. He spoke to David, Remember? When he was out by himself. He spoke to Moses out by himself. He spoke to Jesus, even, at the Garden of Gethsemane, away from everybody. Can I tell you, most, most likely, you, you, the things that may be life-changing or the things that God wants to do in your life, 
you may have to get alone with him. You may, you may have to get to a place where there's no noise and there's no people and there's no stuff. There's no phone ringing. There's no kids running around. Nobody's calling. It, you just need to get alone with God, to hear God. Because listen, we got a thousand things running through our minds today. I wish I could go through a list of things that we had to deal with today between church and work and, and stuff and stuff. And, and if you're not careful, all those things will be major. All, you'll, you'll get them all as major. The major thing in my life right now, above all else, is to make sure that I'm right with God. That's it. That's the major thing. I want to make sure because a lot of things hinge on that. This church, this place God sent me. You don't listen. You don't need a pastor that ain't hearing from God. You okay? You don't need a man of God that's not hearing from God. You, you, don't, you don't need Sunday school teachers that aren't hearing from God. You don't need leaders in your church that ain't hearing from God. That's what's wrong with our churches today. A lot of people aren't hearing from God anymore. They're just, they're just growing churches like they grow businesses. And, and if we're not careful, we leave God out of all of it. You know, and, and, and I ride these kids, boy. I know y'all hear me get on them, but listen. They understand that. They understand you're getting on to them. And I guarantee you they'll love it. I talked to everyone when they went out. They smiled and cut. And one little boy said, he's sorry. That's what you do. You don't let them do that. You show them you love them when you correct them. God shows me he loves me when he corrects me. That's how, that's how it is with our Heavenly Father. That's why we replay that in our kids. Watch this. And he came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance of the remission of sins. And as it is written in the book of the words Isaiah, the prophet saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the, law of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain shall be brought low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough way shall be made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of the Lord. He said, God's going to work everything out. That's what he said. Listen, God's going to do some things. He's going to change some things. And everybody, everybody will see the salvation of the Lord. You say, well, everybody's not going to get saved. You're right. But everybody here will see the salvation of the Lord. There'll be folks left here who wish they went with us. You know, it'd be like us all going on a trip and others not getting to go. They got to see us leave and go to wherever, the mountains, and they wish they could go. There'll be a time where they wish they had. This is starting to, now, now keep that in mind. This, 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 this idea leans itself all the way back to Joshua chapter 4. Those that wanted to go were left because they didn't choose to go. And I'm going to tell you something. Tonight, you choose. You decide whether or not you want to be right with God. I'm going to tell you, it ain't just, it ain't just lost people that need to, be, to get right with the Lord. The saved people need to get right with the Lord. Just because you saved going to heaven doesn't mean you don't sin any longer. We have to ask God forgiveness of our sins. We have to ask God to get right. Don't think that just because you know you're saved that you can't get so out of sorts that you look like lost folk. You have to stay in a place where you're constantly asking God to forgive you. That's what First John tells us, or second. says, listen, if you, if you, I can't remember exactly, you probably tell me, if you, if you say you have no sin, you deceive yourself. Kind of like that. That's probably like the Ray revised version of the Bible right there. But you know what I mean. So we, we tell ourselves, we're okay, we're okay. But, and, and we're covering up so much sin. And, and, and just because things bad aren't happening doesn't mean you're right with God. Could it be that the devil leaves you alone because you don't need his help? And you're sliding farther and farther away. And life's good. Making more money than you ever made. You're able to go out and eat, get you a new car, new house, new boat, new stuff, new everything. Everything's good. The devil's backed off because you just, you, you, you're driving away from God on your own. Listen, you, we as Christians had to get on our knees before God and ask God to show us what's important. And listen, I, that is more and more evident in these days. I'm looking forward to the future here because I believe God's doing some things. So here we have, uh, and all flesh shall see the salvation of the Lord. So remember, remember that. We're going to talk about that in Joshua 4 about the group being left and the group in the promised land. Hang on to that. Then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized, John the Baptist. Then, had, then said he to the multitude uh, uh, that came forth to be baptized of him. Old generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee 
from the wrath to come. He said, who told you, to, who told you uh, 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 there's a wrath coming? Who told you to flee from the wrath to come? And he called them a generation of vipers. It's hard preaching. Anybody ever heard of Phil Kidd? <laughs> he, hey, Phil will talk about his own wife in church. Listen, he'll preach on anybody. He'll preach hard. Um, I probably couldn't sit under Mr. Phil Kidd. I, I, I enjoy listening to him because some of it's pretty good stuff. But, 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 but listen, he uh, <laughs> trying, trying. Um, but John the Baptist is preaching hard. He said, oh, generation of vipers. He's talking to Pharisees. He's talking to publicans. He's talking to soldiers here. He's talking to you know, tax collectors that are there. He's talking to soldiers. He's talking to a group of people. He's talking to a group of soldiers that could, who could run a spear through him and kill him and nobody be wiser. The soldiers, you've got to understand, could have been Roman soldiers. Not of the Jewish nation. They could have been soldiers from the Jewish people. Caiaphas and, and, and Annas were there, so they might have had soldiers themselves. I have no idea. I'm building, this, I'm building this in my head. So we have the high priests hanging around, probably, listening. This strange guy's down at Jordan River, baptizing folk, four or five miles out of town. So they walk down early morning. This is what's going on. Big crowd of people. And, and, and he gets through talking about words quoting from, from Isaiah. And, and, and understand now, it's been four, how many, 400 years from this point past into, into the past. They hadn't heard anything. God hadn't shown up. There's been no miracles. There's been no great movements. Nothing. 400 years where, it was, where, where God was just silent. It just, when Isaiah got done, Brother Mike, it, it was it. We had a long time, a long, big gap uh, of time where there was no open word from God. People wouldn't be in moved anymore. Here's the funny thing about that. They were still all going to church. Everybody still went down to God's house. They went to the temple, the synagogue down there, whatever they called it in those days. And, and they would come, and they would make their sacrifices to the priest. They'd give their money. They'd give their stuff. They'd, they'd walk their land without spot or blemish. And there wasn't no Ark of the Covenant back there. It's gone. And supposedly, that's what they believed, that the presence of God was with the Ark of the Covenant, so they came to worship where God was. God was gone. But they still came to worship. But they wasn't worshiping anymore. They was going through motions of things that, that, that no longer satisfied any spiritual desire. <laughs> and it, it, just, it just it started with a great, 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 great grandpa. How many generations in 400 years? I don't know. For three generations in 100 years. Twelve generations back, the family spirit started waning about the things of God. So here we are, twelve generations or so later, and they're just going to church. You know, I think it's in, a, it's in Psalms or Proverbs. You know, when the Lord does this, I, I, I wish he'd help me remember where it's from. Because he always brings these verses up that I can remember parts of, but I can't quite remember where they're from, but I read them. But the Bible talks about, I believe it's Psalms or Proverbs, and it's in a song, you've heard it. Lord, let me be the generation that seeks your face. Let me be that generation. L listen, let us be the generation of people. Let, let this church be the generation of people that seek after the things of God, and we want God to show up. Let, let, let this be the time for us. I believe God's got his hand on this place, and I believe God really really wants to do some things in this church. Listen, there's things that, that, that are in my prayer life that God's laid on my heart about the future of this church that I'm afraid to even tell you. I really am. Simply because I, I don't doubt that God will do whatever he wants to do. I just worry how people can take things sometimes. I believe God's really got a plan for this church. And, and there's going to come a time where you have to make some, some choices you know, of what, what direction do we want to be or, or where, where, what, what, we're, what do we do? Listen, there's going to come a time we're going to have to build a family life center. I, we about to the place where we need to cut bait or fish, you know? And it, it's, it ain't a three or $400,000 job. It's a big job. But what do we want for our future? He says, what we're going to do is we're all going to make sacrifice. So that the kids, three generations from now, growing up here. I told you a story. I'll tell it again. When I picked a backer for a man by the name of uh, Mr. Uh, Gowan, 
this guy's dad's name? Albert Gallon. This used to pick Mr. Al tobacco for Mr. Albert. He had a long field. Man, them rows were long. I mean, they were so long that they had a road in between so you could stop and take a break. They were that long. You talk about a tobacco row. You want a tobacco row, you can go down half hour. You want to go down and back in an hour. Uh, you really don't want to take that long because you don't get a lot done. If you get a picker, you got 40. Listen, it takes a long time. But we picked the backer from one end to the other, and there was a line of oak trees all the way across that field. It was a field probably 35, 30 acres. About 10 of it was in tobacco. But on that far row, far away from us, at the end of the tobacco row, was lines of oak trees, all of them the same size. A couple of gaps where lightning got one or wind got one or somebody mowed one down when it was younger. A line of trees and a fence. We got down there. We, get, we couldn't hardly wait to get down there in the shade. Listen, you can smell the shade. And, then, and when you turn to come back, you can smell the pond. Because pond was on this side. Mr. Albert was smart enough to start on the pond side. And if you could outpick everybody, which I could, listen, you give a lazy man a hard job, he'll find an easy way to do it. I would be first back out the other side so I could swim a little while till they got done. You bet you. I get down, whoosh, boosh in the pond. But on the far end, all these trees, we got down at the end one day, and we were sitting there taking a little break and getting some water. Mr. Albert was standing there, was getting off track. tractor, had an old farm all, he gets off track. tractor. And uh, I said, Mr. Albert, I said, did y'all clean these trees out of this field? He said, nope, Daddy, my dad. He said, his dad, his people did. Mr. Albert was 100 years old then, I thought. I don't know how old he was, 60, 70 years old, I don't remember. But when I was 13, he was ancient. I said, well, how did, and there was trees. I had no idea how old the trees were. He said, ah, they're probably 50 years, 40, 50 years old. I said, well, did, when y'all cleared this out, did, did y'all leave these that was in a row? He said, no, we planted them. He said, we, he said, we planted these trees when I was young. I said, well, so these trees are as old as you are. He said, about. He said, I'm probably 10 years older than them. I said, huh. That came to me years later, years later, when I was working and talk, talked to a bunch of kids, and I was explaining to them about things they had to do today for the future. Here's what Mr. Albert told me about them trees. I said, Why, what made y'all plant them trees? He said, because we knew that one day you'd be down here in the shade. That's what he said. We knew that one day, because they've been picking a backer in that field for 50 years probably or whatever they grew, but there was shade down there. That's the only place there was shade. It was a big, giant field, but it was a line of trees where there was shade. And if the, if the sun was that way, you'd get on this side. If it was still early, you'd get on that side, but there was shade. He said, we knew there was gonna be, it was going to come a time, if time lasted, where people would be able to crawl under this place for shade. And that's what we're doing. We're just planting trees. We making, listen, we making shade for that next group of people that's coming. You know what that next group of people is going to do? They're going to, enjoy that. They're going to enjoy the building blocks and the foundation you guys have built. And they're going to build more shade. That's the goal. This was shade. This right here, Brother Teak, y'all to work, Brother Page, all the stuff y'all have done here, shade. Done it for another generation. Y'all could have left that single wide out here. You done all, done all no, 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 y'all wasn't happy with that. Everybody had to keep going, keep building shade, keep building shade. So now look what we got. You don't owe no money. You, you guys have poured your lives into a place now there's shade. So John the Baptist is saying the very same thing to these people. Hey, look, watch, watch this, watch this. Here's what, let me move on. He said, bring forth fruits worthy of repentance and begin not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. Pay attention right here. He said, we have Abraham to our father, for I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children of Abraham. Now, when he says that, what is he talking about? When he says, God is able of these stones to raise up children of Abraham. Now, I'll, I'll just tell you about it, but you can go back and read Joshua 2, 3, 4. You, you can read those if you want to when you get home now. Back in Joshua, Moses had died, Deuteronomy, in the Deuteronomy. Is that right, Joshua? Deuteronomy, yeah. Am I getting them mixed up? Sometimes I do that. Y'all know I do that, right? But anyway, two chapters earlier, Moses died, wherever the book is right for Who's Deuteronomy? So Moses died. He, he, he sinned. He, he, he broke the rules, and then he wasn't able to go into 
the promised land. But God took him up on top of Mount Nebo and said, hey, I'm going to show it to you, though. I'm going to show it to you so you know that what I told you is true. You can die a happy man. That says he died. So the Bible, said, uh, Bible teaches us that God even buried him. And nobody knows where, the, where, he, where God buried him at. Why do you think that was? Yep. I, I believe that. Exactly. I believe they, nobody knows where he was buried. If, if not, they'd build a city right there. People have been worshiping Moses. And isn't it something that during, during the times in, in Scripture, at the transfiguration, who are the people that come? Moses and Elijah. Now, during the tribulationary period of time, at three and a half years, there's going to be two people come to give testimony at the wailing wall. There's two people. Guess who those people are? Moses and Elijah. So these two people keep coming down through history. You know, we, we, we keep seeing these people. I got two of them. You keep seeing these people come down through history. Now, here's what happened. Joshua, God did things in front of the people with Joshua that made the people love Joshua like they love Moses, according to, according to the book of Joshua. So God tells Joshua, here's what I want you to do. He said, up on this hill back here, stay back half a mile, 2,000 cubits. Keep all the people back half a mile. Jordan River's down there. What I want you to do, keep everybody back. But I want you to go down there to the Jordan River, get the priests and the people that carry the, the Ark of the Covenant, and when you step out on the waters of the Jordan River, water's going to back up. Now, it was during the flood season. It wasn't just, just a creek. It was a flood it was during that harvest season where there was lots of water, lots of water. They would dig ditches and, and funnel that water to their farms. And so it was during that season where there's lots of water. And, and, and God told Joshua, he said, have them stay back 2,000 cubits, a half a mile. He said, so they can see where to go. They can see what to do. You know, sometimes we get so close to things we can't really see it. Sometimes in our own lives, we have so many things happen and we're so close to it, sometimes we need to back up a little bit and, and look at the big picture. And God might not answer your prayers for a long time. That's his prerogative. And I don't like it. I don't like it. But it's his prerogative. It, God, God might not answer your prayers in your lifetime. I mean, I hate to say it, but God might not have you see your children come to know him in your lifetime they may come to know him in their lifetime not yours I was lost when my granny went to heaven lost as a golf ball in high weeds listen I kind of thought I'd say but I, I, she knew she was always giving me these warnings Jonathan she'd say babe you need to come on in before dark yes ma'am she said the bad man works after dark she's right and she'd give me all these warnings, all these warnings. And, and after I got saved, I began to recognize that she was, she was trying to tell me something for the future. I was trying to see the big picture. Now I look back over 30 years of being saved, I can see what God's been doing. So I don't know. I, for a long time, I didn't know why God made me, me, me and Miss Shug wait 14 years before we could have Emma. Now I do. One of those kids showed up Sunday night, gave a testimony. I couldn't have been that to those kids with all my kids running around my feet, I just couldn't. I, I know if I'm going to do it, i got to do it all the way. And I couldn't do it. And so we was 14 years. Did I like it? Nope, didn't like it. It was hard, to say the least. It's hard. But God knew what he was doing. And it wasn't up to me to even be happy with what God was doing. I'm called to be obedient. There you go. That's, that's brass tacks right there now. I'm called to be obedient. Now, so God told Joshua to tell the people, stay back where they can see the big picture. So he, so he had the people, um, they carried the Ark of the Covenant, the box, it's four feet by two feet by two feet high, made of acacia wood wrapped in solid gold. He said the lid on the Ark of the Covenant was two inches thick, solid gold. And it had a rail around the top of it as wide as a man's hand made of gold. And two cherubims on top of it with their wings reaching out towards each other. Touching across the top of the box. And in the center between those cherubims is where the Spirit of God dwelt. So in the daytime, as they traveled around with the Ark of the Covenant in plain sight of people, in the daytime, there'd be a, there'd be a cloud 
above the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God with his people. People could always see. See, if you're too close, sometimes you, you can't see it and the cloud. When they backed off, they can see the whole picture. They can see the water back up. They can see God do a great miracle. They can see the cloud over the ark. They can see them step on the water and the water back up and that one just go away and just leave an empty river bed. They see all that stuff. But for too close, they can't pass that information down to the next generation of, of their children. So they needed to see it very clearly. That's us. We need to be able to see God's word very clearly to pass it down to this next generation of people that's, that's needing to know the truth. So they stepped out onto the water. The water backed up. And uh, so they started coming across. They all got across. Before they did that, though, God told Joshua to get a person out of the 12 tribes of Israel, one man from the 12 tribes of Israel, choose one, and each man is to get a stone. Here we go. God's able of these stones to raise up children of Abraham. He told us to get one man from each of the 12 tribes of Israel, 12 men, and have each man get one stone. Take it up to the embankment towards Jericho. Well, would you know when they crossed the Jordan River and they went up the bank on the other side, what land they're in, right? What, what was that land they're in now? The promised land. Yeah, they're Canaan, man. They're there. 40 years they've been walking around. Finally, going into promised land. So here's happening. So these four men, they lead the pack. They take these four stones out. Probably He-Man kind of guys trying to outdo the Reuben, trying to outdo Gad, you know. Taking these stones, big as they can tote. Probably pick the biggest guy. And these men tote these stones out in the middle, got them from the bottom of the Jordan River, under, the Bible says, under where the high priest's feet were standing in the middle of the river. Took the stones, big, took them up top of the hill. And they made an altar up there, a memorial. Put all them stones together. They called that place, I believe, if you look right, I think it's a Gilgal. Put all those, all those things there on the other side. Um, to a memorial. He said, so that the generations to come, will all, when they see that pile of stone right there, they'll remember what God did. All these people's backed off a half a mile. They can see it. They're going to pass down right information to the next generation of people. And, and there's a pile of stones over there to make a monument. But that's not all he did. He also, whenever, whenever they went to go across, he said, I want you to do something else. He says, when everybody's across and they move the Ark of the Covenant, it goes toward the bank, set up, a, set up 12 more stones in the middle of the Jordan River as a testament. So he leaves. Guess what happens? When they, when they step out of the water with the Ark, water comes back. Flows over those rocks. We don't hear anything more about those rocks. They're lost. They're lost under the water. Right of sight. Everybody didn't get to go into promised land. Take a minute now. Let your minds sort out. Everybody didn't get to go into promised land. There was some that didn't think God could do what he said he'd do. So for 40 years they walked around in the wilderness until that generation died. I believe that represent personally, I believe that represented that generation of people who didn't believe God could do it. Stay with me. But then on the bank over there represented a group of folks that believed God could do it. A whole new generation of folk that believed God could do something huge in their lives. So Jordan River's flowing back. John the Baptist, how long? 2,000, 2,000, 2,000 years later? Bro, Mike, you have to help me sometimes. My dates fly together. But here we have, a long time later, John the Baptist on the Jordan River, and he makes his statement. Right here at the same place, Bethabara. You, you look the names up in Scripture. I, that's what I've worked on. I have, I have painstakingly dug through stuff for several years trying to find. I know it. Listen, it's got to be within sight because it ain't that long. It ain't that far away. But he says, God is able of these stones to raise up children of Abraham. I believe he's talking about those stones right there. I believe he's talking about the children of Israel and how God saved them and brought them into the promised land. And he's trying to remind them that God did a great thing and he brought them to the promised land. And he's trying to say, that job ain't finished. There's one coming greater than me whose shoe I'm not able to untie. He's trying to tell them about another promised land. 
another place. Here's some, here's some Bible facts. You know, we'll be ready to go. And, and just some things that I've been thinking about um, over the years around this stuff. I've I studied this. I can't let things go sometimes. What does Jesus call us? He calls us fishers of men. And so one of the things that we learn is, is fishers of men. There, listen, there's Bible studies, fishers of men. We, we got a little uh, hook on our hat, you know, fishers of men hooks, things like that. But what do you do with a fish when you catch it? You take it out of the water. You get it out of the water. So you think about that. Our, our responsibility is to take fish out of the water. Our responsibility is to take souls out of the water. Our responsibility is to take souls out of that place and put them in another place, help them get to another place where they can be saved. Our, our responsibility is to, is to catch fish. Jesus said, I'll make you fish as a man. That's our responsibility. So if you look at here now and you see this, we can't see that altar under the water anymore. They didn't have any other chances. But because Jesus came, now, now we, have, we have grace and mercy. We can catch fish. We can, we can take those stones out and bring them up to the other side and put them with the ones that are in the promised land. We can, we can do that work now. You see, back then it was based on their works and what they, if they died right, you know, and they died in, in God. It, you know, there was a criteria they had to keep. So you think about that, that those stones that are covered up. So I believe when John the Baptist is standing on the bank, he talking to the people, and he pointed out to the river, Every Jew within earshot knew exactly what he said. He said, Abraham is able to raise up these stones. Now, question is, was he talking about the ones on the other side of the bank? Were they still there? I believe so. I don't think anybody would have moved those stones on the bank. Those stones represented God taking them to the promised land. That was a memorial they could come back to and remember what God did taking them out of Egypt, bringing them to the promised land. But those stones were gone in the river, gone. Gone. You won't find them being talked about if, if, if this is what we're, this is the only place. I don't know if it's talking about the ones in the river or the ones on the hill. But I believe that it was the ones in the river. I believe he was teaching the people that, that God can, even in your sins, God can save you. God can, God can pull you out and set you in the promised land. God can raise up children of Abraham that will worship him. God can do it. And, and what he's saying to them, they probably understand better in those days than we understand now today. Watch, watch what happens now. I'm, I'm going to finish up with this. For LJ's sake. And he answered and said to them, um, and the people asked him, after he said, you know, every tree will be cut down, and if it, if it doesn't bear fruit, if it's not good, it's going to be hewed down, thrown in the river. So he's telling the people, it's not based on your works. It's not based on what you do. Every tree that don't bear good fruit gets hewn down. They said, well, the soldiers, the public, the tax, yeah. well, what are we supposed to do? And here's what he says. Then came the publicans to the baptismal, and, uh, to, the bab to be baptized, and said to him, Master, what shall we do? The publicans, tax collectors, or the government office people. And he said unto them, exact no more than that which is appointed to you. Just be honest with people. And the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, and what shall we do? He said unto them, do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. And as the people were in expectation, and all men mused in their hearts of John, whether he was the Christ or not. It's a huge statement right there. Because they recognized his words as words of salvation. And they knew that the Messiah was coming to save Either the nation of Israel, the people, but they, he was coming to save. So in their minds, they're thinking, that's him. That's him. And he baptized people there that day. Is the coalition the same? Is the correlation, is it, is it the same pile of rocks? <sighs> I've been studying that for a couple of years. I think it is. I think it is. There's a reason why he said these pile of rocks. I don't know. But at the same time, we have an obligation to get those stones, to get those rocks in the promised land. We have an obligation to still catch fish, to still lead a generation of people that want to be led. That's why it excites me to go preach in different places. I get to speak to baseball teams next, uh, week after next, and I'm excited because they want to hear it. They want to hear preaching. And I believe this book goes before us. 
And the more you know about this book, the more you know about the things that are in this book, the happier you'll be because your knowledge will grow. Those of you look, look that up. Look that up. Pull up ESPN, knowledge. You'll get a video on YouTube. Anyway, let's pray. Lord, we love you and thank you for this time together. God, help us with our Bible knowledge. Help us with these things, God, that you teach us. Help us, God, to, to assert ourselves into ministry, to not just be passive and see it go by. Help us plant shade trees for the future. Be involved in that work. Lord, thank you for this church. I believe this church is going to be a light for a long ways. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you would, please stand. If you'd like to come and pray, please do. It's not just lost people that need to do something with their sin. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I don't want to go anywhere dirty. I don't want to go anywhere dirty. Amen. If you decide to study this and look into it, Bethabara means the house of the ford, meaning there was a, there was a house there or, or some type of structure on the river. And they said that the ford is there today. They said the, the Bible says that the stones are still there to this day. The Bible says. So 2,000 years ago, you know. But they're there to this day. I believe they're there still. Wouldn't it be something? Wouldn't it be something if somebody ever took a picture of those stones? Has the water washed them around? I don't know. But if you look it up, you'll, you'll see Bethabara. Old Testament says Bethabara. New Testament, Bethabara. And Gilgal's thrown in there, and it clouded up the whole thing for me because I surely thought I had it nailed down. But a couple years ago, I saw it talk about Gilgal. And so look it up. Read it. It's just good stuff. It kind of connects the Old Testament to the New Testament, but there's lessons in there. There's lessons in there that God wants to bring out to us. So, hope you have a good week. Anybody have anything to say before we dismiss? Pray for these children. We're supposed to have three bus kids baptized tonight. They don't have any leadership at their house. So, you know, Parker, he's going to have to be the guy. Their moms and dads, uh, they're not so interested in the things of God as Parker and his sisters are. So, pray for them. Pray for them. Um, Abby, Parker's sister, brought a little girl last week named Layla. And Layla got saved last week. Never been here before. Gave her heart to Christ. And now she didn't come tonight. And so we need to be praying how to minister to them and get them here and get that done. So be praying for them. Her mama has COVID. Gotcha, 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 gotcha. But, but pray for them. It ain't like, it ain't, a lot of these kids' houses ain't like your house where you kind of know what's going to happen every day. It's, it's a little different sometimes. So anybody before we go? Brother Mike, would you dismiss us?